Today's lecture is one of a series of major public events that are named in honor of Professor George A. Miller, who was a noted mathematician. He taught at the University of Illinois in the first half of the 20th century and was a quiet and unassuming man. Uh, he was also devoted to the university, and at his death in 1951, he left his estate to the campus, quote, to be used for educational purposes other than current general operating expenses. The estate showed that while he had always lived a simple, modest life, he had also been a very good investor. The estate amounted to nearly $1 million dollars, which was a very considerable sum in 1951. The Miller Committee series began shortly after that as one of several ways to honor Professor Miller's wishes. Our event today is hosted by the School of Architecture and the School of Art and Design and is co-sponsored by a wide range of other campus units uh, that you can see listed on the uh, flyer. Uh, that, that many of you will have received. Uh, we want to thank all of the co-sponsors uh, for their support for this event. Uh, we actually have two upcoming MillerCom lectures uh, on one day uh, coming up, uh, Tuesday, March 10th. The first one will be held here at the Knight Auditorium at 4.30 p.m. on that date. Uh, when Kate Kennedy, research fellow at uh, Girton College, University of Cambridge, will speak on music's war poets. And then this will be followed at 7 p.m. with a lecture by Professor Carl Wieman of Stanford University, who is a Nobel laureate in physics, on taking a scientific approach to scientific science education. This is going to be held at the auditorium of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. We hope that you'll join us for one or uh, ideally both of these events. We also want to welcome you to sign up <clears throat> to receive notices concerning uh, the MillerCom series as well as other events uh, handled by the Center for Advanced Study at cas.illinois.edu. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. So now let us turn to today's guest, Nick Wilding, uh, who will be introduced this afternoon by Heather Hyde Minor, Associate Professor of the History of Architecture here at Illinois. Heather. Thank you, Wayne, and thanks to all of you for being here on this, this relatively balmy and sunny afternoon, uh, a break from our frozen tundra. Before I, want, before I introduce our MillerCom speaker this afternoon, I'd just like to thank a, a couple of people. The first is Philip Fail. This evening's talk is the Philip Fail Lecture, an annual event named for Professor Fail, a distinguished art historian and University of Illinois faculty member who died in 2000. Philip was a beloved teacher and colleague, uh, a sparkling polymath who brought uh, his, his, his version of, of special magic, I think, to every subject to which he turned his scholarly attention, from the rocks on the great frieze uh, at the feet of the gods on the Parthenon to Bernini's Baldacchino in St. Peter's. I'd like to thank especially his, his family and friends for making this, this annual event possible. Yes. I'd also like to thank Valerie Hotchkiss, the director of the Rare Book and Manuscript Library here for, for helping to make so much of this visit possible and for, for allowing us to have such a fantastic visit this morning in our, in our wonderful rich hoard of, of books. Finally, I'd like to thank Arely Marina, who, who was co-organized every part of this uh, with me, uh, who is a spectacular friend and colleague, uh, and it's just a wonderful joy, really, to be, to be able to work on this event with her. So I want to turn to our speaker. Uh, Nick Wilding is an associate professor of history at Georgia State University. He received his BA from Oxford, his MA in Renaissance Studies at Warwick, 
and his PhD from the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. He held postdocs at Stanford, Cambridge, Columbia University, and the American Academy in Rome. A specialist in early modern communication and science, he has worked on two projects that bring archival materials to the internet, the Athanasius Kircher Correspondence Project and the Medici Archive Project. His first book, Galileo's Idol, Gian Francesco Segredo and the Politics of Knowledge, was published by the University of Chicago Press this past September. Nick has also been commissioned by Penguin Classics to produce a new translation of, of Galileo's dialogue on the two chief world systems. Please join me in welcoming uh, him this evening. The title of his talk will be Fake Facsimile Print, The Techniques and Technologies of Textual Reproduction, 1450 to the Future. Uh, what I'd like to do today is kind of sketch out a new project. So. Um, it's at a fairly early stage of development, and I'd be really, really grateful for any uh, factoids, comments, questions, savage critiques, uh, anything like that. So I won't talk for too long, probably about 40 minutes. The talk will be uh, first half sketching out a brief history of book forgery, and uh, the second bit will talk about the Galileo forgeries that some of you may be uh, aware of, uh, and then I'll try and indicate the future of a discipline. Always a foolish activity for a historian to attempt. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have lots of time for questions, discussion, that kind of stuff. So, um, is that leg legible? Is there too much light on the screen, or is that? Is that better? Yeah, okay. Um, that matters more than I do. So, uh, what we are, what I would like to write a history of is the material forgery of printed books. There's been, sorry about that, um, there's been a lot of work on forgery from various different angles, either from the kind of philological approach to forgery, exemplified by historians such as Anthony Grafton's great book, Forgers and Critics, where we're looking at how humanist educated readers detected forgeries by looking at the history of language. Uh, and there's been a lot of work from the material artifact side, whether art history predominantly, where forgery is a major problem in the market today, but has also been a recurring problem uh, over the centuries, or in the wider world of museum studies, uh, where the material aspect has been looked at more closely. Now, bizarrely, the intersection of these two things, the printed book itself as a material forgery, so not looked at from the point of view of content, uh, but looked at the techniques of materially forging books historically, has not, as far as I can see, been uh, addressed at all. Um, it's always bad to start a talk by saying what you're not going to talk about. But uh, I'm not particularly interested in print piracy, uh, but I am interested in wondering what uh, a history of the term forgery might mean to actors. So what kind of activities do we designate as forgery? Uh, and are those ahistorical categories that we can just go and say forgery, not forgery? Or is forgery an actor's category that has its own history that we can uncover? Um, and I'm not particularly looking at uh, examples of uh, the sophistication of books, so taking uh, various genuine books and making Frankenstein mashups of them to produce better uh, books, or things like uh, remboitage, taking off covers and making false provenance trails by adding a different cover to, uh, to a book uh, than that which it originally had. Although that's kind of a peripheral part of my story. Um, I think, I'm, I hope I'm right in saying that from a technological point of view, the history of forgery runs alongside and is deeply entwined with, and in some ways is merely an extrapolation of the culture of facsimile making. And facsimiles are a useful category to think about, I think, because although we have a kind of knee-jerk reaction to forgery as dishonest, deceptive, and... Uh, 
not a, a good thing to do at all. Uh, when it comes to facsimiles, we're a lot more forgiving. We can understand that in the 19th century, it was perfectly normal practice to introduce facsimiles and perhaps not tell anybody that you've done so. And if they couldn't spot them, that really didn't matter. Facsimiles were part of a book restoration drive at that point. We no longer do that, on the whole, uh, but uh, we can understand that historically the ethics have been, um, been quite different. If you think about facsimile production, then uh, you get to think about uh, a series of different technologies that have been used. Generally, when we think about facsimiles, we think of 19th century uh, photomechanical reproduction, but there are many different kinds of uh, facsimiles, and all of these techniques can potentially be used to forge entire printed books. Uh, the easiest, perhaps, or the technologically uh, least sophisticated, is pen facsimile. Many of you will have seen, perhaps without realizing it, uh, pages supplied in facsimile where uh, hand-written uh, text has been made to mimic precisely a printed page. These are incredibly hard to spot. As long as the ink matches and the paper matches, uh, I've been shown books where I've been told there's a facsimile page in there and I've sat there and not been able to, uh, to spot them. Um, basically, any technique that's used to produce prints can also be used to reproduce prints, right? Print, as we'll see in a minute, one of the things that printing does really well is not only mechanically reproduce a text, but mechanically reproduce itself. So, uh, the techniques of printing are also frequently used by facsimiles or by forgers. Woodcuts, if you're trying to forge a woodcut or produce a, a, a facsimile sheet of a woodcut produced image, woodcut's a pretty good technique because it produces a very convincing woodcut because it is one. Uh, the same is true of type. Although with type, it doesn't usually take that much work to spot the difference between uh, between a forged book and a genuine one. Um, when we move into the 19th century, late 18th and early 19th century, uh, we start to see the emergence of uh, techniques which feel more uh, modern to us. So chemical transfer, you can uh, make inks chemically react. So actually, it turns out destructively, um, lay a surface onto a printed page and take a chemical image and use that to make repeat printings. Not at all good for the original, but you can make lots of copies. Um, and then moving, as we move through the 19th century, we move into the great era of photomechanical facsimile and forgery uh, production. And it's my contention we are now uh, well into uh, by no means the final stage, but a very interesting stage of digital forgery. <coughs> I'd like to uh, think a little bit about the um, alleged origins and function of print in early modern Europe. Uh, here we have, uh, as you all know, an Albrecht Dürer, uh, a couple of angels holding up a drying print, it seems to be, of the face of Jesus, the Veronica image. And what's going on here, it's commonly argued, is that Jura is not only arguing uh, for his ability as an artist, but he's arguing that print itself, the art of mechanical reproduction, bears with it the capacity to convey the divine. That idea the print is not a cheap knockoff of manuscript culture. The print isn't ersatz uh, writing or drawing, but that it is somehow a mode of reproduction which can attain a higher level of, almost a higher ontological level, uh, is very old, I think. The idea that because the human hand has not, with all its errors, and sinfulness uh, necessarily actually touched the object, but the object has been built by a machine, 
uh, it's somehow better than a manuscript. Uh, can, I think, be found, so go, going directly against the kind of uh, Avenian argument about the loss of aura by the introduction of machines, and, and our modern perspective that machines make uh, mechanically reproducible trash, whereas the handmade is the authentic. Um, I think you find that really far back in the history of print. If you look at the earliest prints that circulate in Europe, not in Germany in the 15th century, but uh, here we are looking at uh, a, an Arabic, um, an Islamic um, talisman, uh, an early woodcut printed image. That one, I think, is from Egypt from the uh, 14th century. Uh, and here we actually have, I think this image is reversed, uh, a metal block that's used for printing that kind of image. Um, main, these images are usually uh, religious in function. They are either uh, talismans that ward off curses or they, uh, what you frequently find in the earliest printed images are pilgrimage certificates where you would write in your own name on the image. So the, the print is not a cheap knockoff of manuscript culture. It bears with it a, um, a really serious theological job. And I think that idea in the Islamic history of print, which I would argue without any evidence at all yet, but I'm hoping if I argue it enough, some evidence might uh, emerge, <laughs> is that there may well be a direct technology transfer from uh, China and Korea through the Islamic world into Egypt. This is Spanish, and it's uh, 13th century. Uh, so this is the earliest European printing, not Gutenberg's Bible. I can't see what that piece of paper says, sorry. Uh, no, I still can't. Just shout, shout up and Turn on light. Turn on light. I did. Sorry. Yeah, it's on. It's on, but there's no... Oh, hello. Hello. Wow. Puberty just hit. Okay. Um, is that better? Okay. Sorry. Sorry about... It. Is it not... Are we good now? Or is that the... Do I have to turn light? Let me put this a lower, a lower down. Hello. No? Yes? Whatever. I'll just, I'll just holler. Um, so the earliest European printing should not be considered to be uh, the work of a crazy lone genius, Johannes Gutenberg, but part of a culmination, perhaps not of direct technology transfer, but perhaps the way technology usually transfers via garbled accounts uh, heard secondhand and then re-engineered uh, to produce the effect that it's been assumed uh, was uh, or originally uh, around. So it may not be that in Germany um, in the 1450s Gutenberg actually saw printed Islamic material and thought, huh, maybe there's some money to be made in that. But I think uh, in terms of the general culture of early print, uh, we have to take seriously this idea of um, the mechanical reproduction and amplification even of religious aura. Uh, bear in mind uh, that Gutenberg's uh, brilliant startup uh, failure before he hit on the uh, idea of a 42-line Bible and some school books was uh, the producer of pilgrim badge mirrors. Uh, so this badge would originally in the circle at the top have had a little mirror and you'd put it on your hat and go off on a pilgrimage. Uh, sometimes you would cover these things up or you'd have the mirrors on the end of a stick uh, and you would go along to uh, the ostentation of a relic. At the moment when the relic is uncovered, you would uncover your mirror on your hat and the uh, sacred radiance would infuse itself in the mirror. You'd then cover it up and take it back home and share some of the love uh, with the people who didn't come on pilgrimage uh, with you. And in some ways, I think that this is the same thing. The Gutenberg Bible is the same thing. It's a machine 
uh, disseminating and amplifying and reproducing and making more copious God's word. It's just this is doing it with bits of lead. Well, they're both doing it with bits of lead. Metal metallurgically, uh, similar technologies are going on. <coughs> so let's move on to um, forgery. The idea of... Uh, invoking the sacrality or potential sacrality of print, uh, I propose really just to set up a model where you can see how uh, that technology can turn back on itself and reproduce itself. Um, and we'll see some examples of very early reprintings of, uh, of early printing. So one of the first thing that prints the printing prints is itself. This, I think, is a, I hope, uh, a surprising little graph I just want to uh, throw up there. Uh, it's probably statistically completely unrepresentative, but uh, it's very, very hard to, um, to get raw data this early in, the, uh, in a project. What I've done here is look at the uh, catalog of... Um, Italian books held in Italian libraries called uh, Edit 16, an online, uh, online catalog, uh, 16th century Italian books. So, and what the catalogers have done very nicely for me is uh, use the term um, counterfeit as one of their descriptors. So you can search purely under the category uh, Counterfeit. It's unclear what the criteria, uh, criterion for calling something a counterfeit is, but um, what I found interesting in this is that they detect, so this is all 16th century books, and what I've done here is take the date of the counterfeiting. What I imagined before doing this, uh, this counting, uh, would this graph would look like, would be kind of the opposite. I'd have thought that there would be no 16th century forgeries of 16th century books or 17th century forgeries or even 18th century forgeries. I thought we'd see a, a line that shot up into the 19th and 20th centuries. And instead what we see is this um, abundance of nearly 50, no, over 50-ish no, uh, editions in the 16th and 17th centuries that are forgeries or counterfeits the vocabulary is uh, slippery here, of 16th century books. So the first thing to investigate is what are those first two or three bars actually representing? Uh, here's an example. This is actually one of these I think I pulled out uh, this morning in your excellent rare book room. I had so much fun there. Uh, I don't know. I think it's the one on the left, but I can't tell, which is kind of the point. Uh, what we have here is uh, Aldo Manutio, Aldus Manutius's printing of uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. Here we are, right at the start of hell. Um, on the left, maybe, um, Aldus's Venetian imprint, and on the right, a Lyonnais, uh, what's usually described as a pirate edition. We get very angry about, uh, about printers. Uh, doing things, oh, um, we call them things like pirates. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure why. Aldous also, and, y and you can see that uh, at the level of um, typography, mise en page, uh, this is a very, very close imitation. Um, Aldous was quite annoyed by this, uh, but it's unclear exactly why he was annoyed. Uh, this is one of the books that's described as a counterfeit in the um, Edit 16 catalog. Uh, so he drew up a uh, complaint, a petition, um, strangely, to the Venetian Senate, uh, basically along guild uh, lines, because there was no other authority to uh, appeal to, and he said, um, what did he say? He said, um, 
What I've learned to do is uh, make letters with ligatures which seem as though they're done by pen. Right? That's what print can do. It can efface itself. Um, and it, they seem like they're handwritten. That's what italic can do that's really, really cool. That's, that's my invention. Um, and along have come some other people who, and here he does use the word falsato, who falsely say, it's unclear, the grammar here is a little weird, um, that the book falsely claims to be printed in Florence, whereas in fact these are uh, printed in France, in Lyon. Um, and then he repeatedly uses this term contrefacte, counterfeit. Contrefacto, uh, and then he demands that nobody else should be allowed to make or counterfeit or print or counterfeit made books. He's covering as many options as possible here, and I don't think he had a good lawyer. Uh, and that's what he's, he's trying to uh, stop here. Now, the term counterfeit in this period even in English, but especially in French and uh, it Italian, is a very ambiguous term. It doesn't necessarily what we mean what we mean now by counterfeit, where it has a, a, a very ne strong negative um, meaning. Counterfeiting just means representing. A perfect counterfeit is a non-deceptive, say, a portrait of someone, an accurate portrait. Um, so we shouldn't see this necessarily, although he's trying to defend his, uh, his something or other, uh, it's not necessarily uh, based on an idea of authenticity. I think it's more based, probably what's being defended here is uh, typographic design more than anything else. Uh, in any case, uh, it didn't work. He had to then produce this lovely sheet where he tells you how to spot the counterfeits because they're so good. There's a misprint on page 412 in, the, in their edition of Terence, damn it. Don't read that one, it's lousy. Um, actually, you know, an old, there's not, bibliographers always claim that the pirate is a, is a lousy print, but it's not, it's not really materially or textually much worse. And, and we shouldn't assume that unauthorized editions are always worse for the readers or that the readers care. Uh, so part of this project is about uncovering readerly responses to uh, dealing with texts that are claimed to be forgeries or, um, or pirate editions or in some way counterfeits. Um, didn't work for the rest of the 16th century. They went on, uh, this is another fake from uh, later on. They just, whatever uh, attempts he did to protect his, his uh, work, they just copy it. You can't spot the difference. Print can print itself very well. <coughs> if we now return to that, uh, that graph and think about the curious, or think about the uh, 19th century uh, part, the, the part that seems more, um, well, underrepresented here. I think it's underrepresented, and it's not a graph that shoots up like that, because the 16th century is not the main target for counterfeiters. I think in the 19th century, they go more, the incunable is invented as a concept uh, for collectors and libraries. And uh, that becomes the main site of uh, forgery. Uh, the kinds of things that are circulating in the 19th century are uh, things like this. Um, that's supposed to be a 1430 German woodcut. Uh, it looks kind of fascist to me, but it's actually earlier than that. Um, uh, and one of the tools that I want to use that I think scholars don't use enough of, uh, bibliographical scholars don't use enough of, are uh, uh, booksellers' catalogues. The great uh, qu company Quaritch uh, described this as a manifest forgery and offer it for, t for two quid, um, saying uh, Mance 1430, actually about 1820, and then they offer another thing, a stupid forgery. I think that should be... <laughs> That should be a required bibliographical term, stupid <laughs> forgery, uh, by the same hand that executed the Strata Christi. Um, 
Bibliographers do have a hard time with forgeries because it's hard to know how to uh, classify them. New York Public Library actually has one of these. They've got a lot of late 19th century collections that included forgeries, sometimes knowingly bought, sometimes less so. Uh, and what we have here uh, is um, a full account of uh, the book described in the note as a forgery. And the New York Public Library has this wonderful uh, idiosyncratic call number, KGF, the F is for forgery. Uh, so that's just a, sh a shelf model, everything that's dodgy, or probably not everything that's dodgy, but everything that uh, is definitely uh, forged in the collection. It's a great resource for, for scholars, um, which I hope to be using next year, work my way right the way through that. Uh, Probably the most famous forgery, and, and as far as I know, nobody has ever unraveled this mystery. Uh, the earliest accounts of uh, Columbus's uh, trips to the New World were printed in many editions. I think it's 17 editions in 1493 uh, and 94. Uh, in various different languages, some of them existing only in single copies. So Columbus letters, as they're known to collectors, are really desirable objects and any desirable short object. This is only usually f six printed pages, I think, um, gets forged frequently. Uh, here we have the imprint Paris, maybe, uh, around 1886. Uh, and wonderfully, the note facsimile of the Ambrosian copy of the quarto edition of the Columbus letter, originally published uh, 1493, um, apparently one of 150 lithographic examples made from a pen facsimile of the Ambrosian copy around 1886. So here we have two stages of forgery, or maybe not forgery. I think it's important to uh, think of forgery as a term which always uh, signals um, disagreement. If I were to uh, take a biro and write a letter from Christopher Columbus and say, do you want to buy this, a million, a million bucks, that wouldn't really be a forgery. That would just be me being stupid and you just give me a weird look and walk away. Um, forgeries have to be uh, accepted by one group and then disputed. They're always objects. Uh, that their status as forgery is always... Uh, the product of a, a, a social, socially um, traceable dispute. They're always objects that oscillate between categories. You can't just make something that's a forgery. That's something else. That's an imitation. It has to be about crossing over from uh, some kind of policed boundary. And this has done it perhaps legitimately. Right? We can't even appeal to notions of intentionality which is the usual way we think of forgery, an object intended to deceive. Right? Because you could make a facsimile uh, which has valid study purposes uh, and then find that later it had uh, lost its facsimilian, facsimilic yeah, uh, status. Facsimilic. Facsil no, I want the adjective. Just facsimile. Facsimile status, facsimilic status. Someone make up a word, that's what we need. Um, and has uh, been entered the market as a genuine object and then becomes a forgery. Right? Are you then culpable as the original producer of the forgery? No, it becomes a forgery at some other stage uh, at the moment when it's presented as genuine. Perhaps not even maliciously. Um, now, moving up into the present day, um, this is probably the most famous recent forgery uh, of print material, printed textual material. I have to kind of hedge it in because there are so many forgeries around at the, at the moment. Um, this is the Oath of a Free Man, uh, produced uh, supposedly around 1640. This is supposed to be the first document printed in North America. Uh, we know from manuscript sources the text of this, um, this piece, but there are no uh, extant exemplars. Uh, in the 80s, um, a, an ex-Mormon um, called... Uh, 
Hoffman, Mark Hoffman, um, found one of these, he claimed, in a New York bookstore and took it along to the Library of Congress, uh, who didn't authenticate it but didn't deauthenticate it either. They were just perplexed. Um, this thing circulated around. It was, he was asking for one and a half million dollars uh, in the 80s. Um, and it puzzled a lot of people. The uh, typographic giveaway is, if you look at the descender of the letter Y there, it goes below, uh, or actually the P of the of next word long as well, privileges, and the G of privileges uh, descends into the zone where the ascenders of the line below are sitting. And typographic characters are made by, or print is made by pushing lumps of metal covered with ink into paper. And these lumps of metal, uh, you can't have a descender entering the zone of another letter's dis uh, ascender, right? That doesn't happen in this universe. So this was made um, basically by Hoffman uh, using the, uh, an image taken from another imprint uh, by the same printer that does survive, uh, including his uh, ornaments, and constructing a hostage note, basically, cutting, cutting them up and assembling them, uh, but not really understanding the practice of typography in the 17th century or nowadays. Uh, Hoffman is in... Uh, jail, but not, I think, for forgery, uh, I think for double murder. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a slippery slope. It's an entry-level <laughs> crime. Let's move now on to uh, the stuff that I know about. I haven't been murdered yet. Uh, let's move into the world of Galileo. This is a scandal that broke uh, a couple of years ago, um, and which has not yet ended, and which probably uh, is only just beginning. So in 2007, the German art historian Horst Bredekamp, highly respected, probably the most famous, especially early, for early modernist uh, art historian in Europe, possibly, uh, wrote a dazzling book, uh, Galilei de, Kunst, de Kunstler, uh, explaining that Galileo thought visually, and he thought by drawing, and that our... our science art opposition was anachronistic for understanding Galileo. Very nice argument, not particularly original, it had been made before, but uh, in 500 pages he made it very, very, uh, re repeatedly made that argument. The centerpiece of this book was a brand new uh, discovery, um, a new copy, it turned out, a new copy of uh, Galileo's 1610 uh, world-changing book, the Sidereus Nuncius, um, which we'll come to in a minute. Not everybody uh, who read Bredekamp's account agreed with his uh, analysis of this central object, uh, the new document. And in 2012, Bredekamp published a two-volume or edited a two-volume study where he'd assembled an international team of experts, including Paul Needham, the great incunabulist um, from uh, Princeton, and Harvard paper experts and uh, Italian library stamp experts and kind of dream team uh, put together, where the purpose was to anal well, it's unclear in retrospect what the purpose was, but what seemed to happen was that this single copy of Galileo Sidereus Nuncius uh, was put under intense scrutiny, probably more scrutiny than any single print artifact had ever been put under. And it was concluded that this copy was, in fact, authentic. The authenticity uh, consists of several levels. Um, this is the title page of the copy. It's called the SNML by the geeks uh, in the know, like me, uh, which just stands for Sidereus Nuncius belonging to Martian Lan. Martian Lan is a New York uh, book dealer um, company who purchased this for half a million dollars in 2005 and was hoping to sell it probably for around $10 million. Um, 
What's special about this copy of the Sidereus Nuncius? I mean, all copies of the Sidereus Nuncius are special in their own way, but what's especially special about this is that, uh, sorry, um, there are a few uh, individualized elements that are very, very exciting. Uh, you'll see, let me zap it, we, um, a library stamp there with a little cat. Uh, it's actually a lynx. And that is supposedly the library stamp of the Lyncean Academy, uh, set up in Rome at the start of the 17th century by Federico Cesi, the Roman prince. Uh, Galileo became a member of that in 1611. Uh, and the idea was that this was a possibly a presentation copy from Galileo to the Lynceans. It also has an inscription here, uh, Io, Galileo, Galilei, um, which is meant to be I, in Italian, I, Galileo, Galilei, and then switching into Latin, did this in the manner of uh, classical artists. Uh, if we want to know did what, you wrote your name, well done. Uh, he did more than that. Whereas most copies of the Sidereus Nuncius, this is a genuine copy, I really hope, purchased by the Library of Congress for a million dollars uh, in 2007, they were very nervous about buying this, uh, have, have a series of lovely lunar etchings, the phases of the moon. Galileo constructs his wonderful argument that the moon is not a perfect Arist a sphere as demanded by Aristotle, uh, but actually much like the Earth and has mountains and that we can calculate the height of the mountains by tracing that line very carefully. He exaggerates it enormously. Uh, and uh, make the moon much like the Earth and therefore make the Earth much like the moon and therefore start to rethink uh, the uh, Ptolemaic Aristotelian cosmos and replace it with a Copernican cosmos. Long sentence, breath. Uh, whereas most copies have those etchings, it was noted uh, that some of them do not have these, those etchings. And this is a genuine copy. And there's actually a document where Galileo refers to 24 copies which haven't yet received the etchings uh, that I kind of don't know what to do with. Uh, we now know of 10 uh, that have survived without the etching. So it may be the original print run was 550. If there were 24 uh, without the etchings originally, then this seems a very high survival rate. So I would suspect that maybe 50 didn't go through the second press to receive the etchings. Uh, and uh, probably there were others around. So some copies didn't receive the etchings. They just have these blanks here. In the SNML, the Martian land copy, the space of these etchings was in fact uh, filled with these lovely watercolors of uh, the phases of the moon. Bredekamp reconstructed Galileo's artistic technique, uh, brush stroke by brush stroke, and said this has the uh, the formal stylistic uh, DNA of Galileo. These are Galileo's actual lunar observations. Uh, not only are they in Galileo's hand, Bredekamp argued, they are not merely Galileo making good a copy of the book which failed to receive the etchings. They are the template upon which the etchings are based. And therefore, these become incredibly value, valuable epistemologically because we'd previously thought that we had a sheet of uh, Galileo's moon drawings, which was the document of him observing the lunar surface over the winter of 1609, spring of uh, 1610. But now we don't know what that sheet is. That's relegated to the margins of the history of astronomy. And this becomes the Declaration of Independence, the founding document of, uh, of the scientific revolution. Right? What we're witnessing here is Galileo witnessing the, the first lunar observations through a telescope by Galileo. So they become extraordinarily important. Now, 
I don't think that I can, uh, well, I'm not a, an art historian, so I definitely can't speak about stylistic analysis, its uh, margins of error, any of that. Uh, but I thought that I could perhaps contribute something useful to some of the other elements of this book, uh, all of which puzzled me. Um, if we start with this library stamp, and this is one of the elements that gives it such splendid provenance, the Lynchian uh, Academy stamp. When you start talking to enough book dealers, they're very gossipy people. They're, they're also very uh, gentlemanly and uh, insists on codes of civility and uh, respecting p uh, people's silence. But behind that, they love to gossip. It turned out that around 2005, several... Um, books which hadn't probably previously had Lin Che and uh, library stamps emerged with these library stamps on them. Um, I thought that a good exercise, basic historical test, would be look at some authentic, authentic stamps and see what they look like and then compare them to the stamp on these, uh, these potentially new stamps. Uh, Chase's library was dispersed upon his death. Most of it ended up in a shipwreck uh, off the coast of Germany. But there are enough books that survive in four major collections in uh, the Vatican Library, the Modern Lynchian Academy, uh, Bologna University Library, and Montpellier Medical Library, plus a few private collections, for you to be able to check uh, a random sample of these library stamps and first of all make sure that they correspond to each other, that there aren't several different library stamps being used. I did that and I found that they were all um, pretty much the same. And what I noticed was that there was this break on the inner border there uh, which was never filled. So if that had been carved in the, presumably a woodcut had been made to, uh, to stamp these books, uh, it had broken off probably right at the, uh, the start of its life. Um, that line was intact in the SNML library stamp, and it was also intact in every one of these newly suspicious books, which had a, a provenance that couldn't be traced back before 2005. Uh, and one dealer then told me very candidly to whom he'd sold a book, uh, which had acquired a stamp in the space of two months and then been offered back to him. Duh. Uh, and this fellow was an Italian called uh, Massimo De Caro. So I noted that name down and then really didn't think much more of it. But I decided to look closely at the other elements linking this particular copy to Galileo. I thought that if, they, if all the lines of prov um, provenance linking the copy to Galileo were that flimsy, then probably the illustrations couldn't necessarily be said to be Galileo's. Um, when you compare this signature to Galileo's contemporary signature, it looks like a very bouncy check. It just isn't right. It actually looks perfectly like the signature on Galileo's abjuration certificate of 1633. Uh, which was widely reproduced in facsimile from the 19th century onwards, but it looks nothing like Galileo's uh, signature in 1610. And that struck me as very, very weird. Chesia died in uh, 1630. Uh, why would Galileo give him a book? Well, his library was quickly dispersed. The chronology didn't make sense if this was a 1633 uh, declaration by Galileo. Uh, but even that, so that looked very flimsy as a piece of, of evidence. So the two elements linking the copy to Galileo uh, could, at this point, I thought, be probably discounted completely. What I wanted to know, though, was had the forger taken a genuine copy of the Sidereus Nuncius and embellished it to create a, nice, a really nice provenance, a $10 million artifact instead of a $1 million artifact, or were, were there other elements of the book which were suspect? At around this time, I heard of a report conducted privately for a, uh, a collector in the Washington area who had received a, uh, had bought a copy of Galileo's very rare 1606 um, instruction manual on how to use the geometric compass. You have one here. There's only about 15 in the world. Uh, keep your eyes on that one. 
Um, the Compasso book that this collector was offered uh, seemed wonderful. It had an early ownership inscription, it had some marginalia, uh, the paper was watermarked, looked more or less right. Uh, the collector was very happy and I think paid about a million dollars for this copy. Six months later, by another channel, the same collector was offered another copy. Now, if there's only 15 of these things in the world, uh, there's some Oscar Wilde line about to do it once would be misfortunate, but um, <laughs> that starts to become pretty weird. And then a third copy emerged another three months later. And because there aren't that many people with a spare million dollars for Galileana, everything uh, arrived at the same, uh, the same point. At this point, the collector took along these two copies to the Library of Congress and asked them to compare uh, their genuine copy, Rosenwald copy, with these two copies that he'd, one of which he'd bought, one of which he'd been offered. And it was discovered that there were not only problems with the watermarks, that they just didn't match up correctly, but also that there was a typographic error, uh, which meant that the book had not been produced using uh, a hand press and bits of metal type. It had somehow been produced using a different technology. Now, hearing that rumor and noting the timing, this was in 2005, and noting that this book came onto the market in 2005, I became very, very suspicious. So I decided to assume that this book had also not been produced typographically, but I needed to find evidence. The first thing I noticed was that there was a little beauty spot over the letter L, uh, which I assumed was uh, a fleck of ink uh, that sat on the surface of the page. I asked Paul Needham to re-examine the book, uh, and he said, strange thing about that dot, it's actually deeply imprinted at the, with the same depth, letterpress depth of impression as the letter around it. In order for that to happen, you'd have to imagine that the cast letter had ruptured massively and that the face of the letter, uh, there was a little pillar emerging here. Um, more troubling, I noticed that that little pillar, that dot, wasn't impressed on any other copy I could find, apart from one other copy, which emerged also in 2005 and was put up for sale at Sotheby's and failed to sell because there was something very weird about it. So I asked myself, why did these two, uh, do these two copies both have this bizarre printing anomaly which doesn't seem typographic? As yet, no deep proof, but um, the object's becoming less and less uh, secure. Next, I noticed, and this hadn't been noticed by uh, Bredekamp or his team, that there's actually a typographic error on the title page. Now, Bredekamp and his team had argued that the uh, SNML was a proof copy. They'd noticed various uh, typographic anomalies, variants, throughout the book. All of these variants consisted of uh, parts of letters not being present in SNML. So it looked like broken type that had been used in SNML had been taken out and replaced with good type. So a crossbar of a T just wasn't there, and then uh, it was in the normal edition. And because of this, Needham argued that what we were looking at was uh, a proof copy. Now, I was very uncomfortable by this category of proof copy from an early modern print shop. As far as I could tell, uh, there was no such animal. Uh, and I looked at, again, went to uh, Tony Grafton's book, The Culture of Correction, and could see no example of a printer pulling a proof and then assembling a copy of all of those proofs of the entire book into one bound copy. That never happens in a print shop. So the Pepiodis, uh, you see P-E, uh, I can zap it, uh, P-E-P, that should be an R. And in every normal copy, it's Periodis. We're talking about the periods of the satellites of Jupiter. Here we have Pepiodis, not a Latin word. And the uh, links eyed amongst you will notice that the P and the I tenderly kiss there in a way that typographic characters, standoffish uh, types that they are, can't do. 
right? Because they are little uh, raised bits of metal on bodies of metal. You, can't, you can space them out as much as you want using other bits of metal, but you can't make them touch each other unless you were to take a file to the side of them or cast a PI ligature letter, which doesn't exist in the, uh, any compositor's box I've ever seen. So this made me think, you know, maybe here we have evidence that this is a uh, non-typographical ar artifact. Still Needham was uh, unsure about it. He said maybe it was just smaller letter P, the descender's not very big, it came from the wrong font or something. Maybe it was just misshapen. Um, he hadn't noticed it, but uh, he was willing to discuss it further. Uh, that's what it should look like. Now the final, the piece of evidence that actually uh, convinced uh, first of all myself and then Paul Needham and then much later uh, everyone else who's involved in the Galileo Zo study uh, is this element. This little smudge to the left of the letter P of privilegio. Uh, I looked at that and I thought nothing of it. I knew that I'd seen that a thousand times before because I am uh, that anal that I've looked at just uh, lots and lots of um, copies of the Sidereus Nuncius or images of the Sidereus Nuncius and I knew that I'd seen that before and of course it's in it's in Wikipedia so it's true right uh, you as a historian that's your all of us admit it that's our first source of authority there it is on the Wikipedia page you google uh, Sidereus Nuncius title page image and that's what you get I almost stopped looking because it was there uh, but then I decided to trace the image history of the Wikipedia image and it found that it came from a 1964 facsimile that also has the same thing. Now a facsimile made in 1964 is produced using black and white photography of a genuine uh, copy. I looked up in the 1964 facsimile which copy was uh, used and it said a copy in Florence uh, and then I read Galileo's own and I noticed that Paul Needham had actually included a paragraph about this 1964 facsimile saying, strange thing about this facsimile, it's not based on the Florentine copy that it says it is. Um, he'd drawn up a kind of digital, a fingerprint of identifying features for every single copy that he examined. It actually uh, must be based, because of its peculiar variance, on a copy in the Brera Observatory Library in Milan. So I thought, well, that's weird. If the facsimile is uh, based on the Brera copy, what does the Brera copy look like? And the Brera copy, wonderfully, ah, yeah, thank you, good crowd, um, has, uh, don't be embarrassed if you didn't, ah, you can do it at any point, has some foxing next to the letter P, right? That's not a printed artifact. That's paper discoloration. So that, so... Nick, I said to myself, if the Brera copy is the source of the 1964 facsimile, is the source of the Wikipedia uh, image, and the Brera copy does not have a misshapen uh, piece of type with a huge club foot somehow rupturing out of lead, uh, but it, in fact that mark is only produced by black and white photography of a brown stain uh, on the paper, that mark only came into existence in 1964. It what didn't exist in 1610, and it's not typographically produced. It's photographically produced in 1964. Given that it's photographically uh, produced, comes into existence in 1964, it's seeing the same mark with exactly the same... I'm not sure if you can see, there's a kind of darker splodge inside here that has this little hook there. It's exactly the same as the mark on the uh, Martin Lansideris Nuncius. Therefore, unless time travel is possible, and I'm not saying it's not, but it puts a lot of us historians out of business, the Martin Land copy post dates 1964, and it's not a genuine copy, and it's not produced using type. It's produced photomechanically. That sent a shiver down my spine. Um, there's our hero. Uh, Massimo De Cardo, would you like to buy this book? Uh, he's here. So while I was doing this work, uh, only tangentially, a scandal erupted 
Here we see him in the Girolamini Library in Naples, a late 16th century Oratorian library, with a wonder, well, used to have a wonderful book collection. Massimo De Caro doesn't have a PhD or an MA in library studies or even a BA, had somehow, through political maneuvering, got himself uh, made director of this library. And here we see the publicity shot. Uh, what the shot doesn't show is that he was simultaneously stealing every valuable book he could find from this library. He stole about four and a half thousand rare books from this library. Uh, about a thousand of them were returned to Italy last week from Germany where he tried to send them to an auction house. Um, but there are still probably a couple of thousand that are presumably on the open market. They've been mutilated, their library stamps are faced, and De Caro destroyed the card catalogues for them, so we don't actually know what's missing. Um, De Caro, it turned out, was the source of the uh, Martian land Sidereus Nuncius, as well as being a major league book thief. Uh, he was the forger. He's now admitted this. He's also admitted to being the forger of the three copies so far detected of the 1606 Compasso. And I've traced about another 20 copies of books that have been forged by De Caro. So although the uh, SNML is the most spectacular of these because it claims to be Galileo's proof copy, or that's what uh, Horst Bredekamp claimed it to be, um, it's not an isolated hoax or a challenge to the, uh, an emperor's new clothes challenge to the world of academia. It's part of a large-scale organized crime um, program uh, to both sell fakes on the open market, but more important, to steal books from institutional libraries and substitute them with fakes. That's where most of these things have turned up. I don't, uh, I, I started working on this thinking that fakes were kind of romantic and cool and Borgesian and postmodern, and, uh, and now I have no time for that. Um, volume three has now emerged of uh, Galileo's O, uh, subtitle A uh, Forgery, um, or A Galileo Forgery, uh, and the arguments are very nicely laid out by Paul Needham about the typographic uh, problems with this book and the evidence that he missed uh, while reconstructing his hypo hypothesis of uh, autograph proof copy. Much less successful, I think, is Bredekamp's approach, which is to say it was such a good forgery that even I did not spot it. Uh, and that this is basically uh, De Caro uh, hoaxing or taking on a, an, an academic duel uh, with him. I think that's self-serving. It's the argument that De Caro also makes that this wasn't crime, this was just uh, challenging academics and showing that they didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, I've yet to see, there's now volume four as well, in which Bredekamp goes back to the original publication from 2007 and removes Galileo's O, uh, removes SNML, the central piece of evidence from it. I'm not sure whether there's much left there. Sorry, character assassination, shouldn't do that. Um, now, we can't do this kind of work. This, this took me a couple of months to uh, think through how to identify the uh, characteristic features. Oh, I'm going on too long. Sorry, I'll, I'll uh, zip through the next ones. Um, that allow us to differentiate between uh, typographically produced books and photomechanically produced forgeries. We can't uh, do this kind of work looking for minor anomalies with every single copy. We just don't have time. So uh, I tried to think through what some general indicators might be of suspicious uh, artifacts. If we think not about the letters, um, but about the incidental elements, such as the space bars and the furniture, around the letters, and think about what happens to ink that gets onto those, uh, those parts of the uh, composed form when paper touches them. And then think about the technology that's being used now. This is a, a um, photopolymer plate. Probably if you know anything about hand printing or about early modern books, you probably don't know much about these, but anybody involved in modern printing uh, is probably very familiar with these. This is a light-sensitive plastic plate. 
uh, which hardens when exposed to light. So you layer photonegative onto it, expose it to light, similar to the stuff that dentists use uh, to make fillings. Um, and then you wash away the unexposed part of the plate and you're left with this nice three-dimensional uh, printing plate. Super cheap, easy, uh, nice to print from. I wanted to think what artifactual differences these te two technologies uh, might produce. So uh, a Galilean thought experiment. What I'm interested in is the ink seeping into the nooks and crannies of uh, hand uh, printing. Print from this, and what you will get is uh, so lay a sheet of paper on on that, and you will, and press very hard. That's all that printing is. You will get nice deep letterpress impression with ink. Right? That's why we like these old books so much. Uh, this lovely three-dimensional impressed surface. You will also find little lines of ink around the edges of the page, which don't have any impression behind them because they're only uh, produced by light contact. The sheet of paper just touches the, uh, the furniture there, maybe picks up a little bit of ink. Now, if you take that printed sheet and photograph it and turn it into a photopolymer plate, the photopolymer plate will not distinguish between impressed surfaces and inked surfaces. So uh, what we'll get is a plate that looks like that. Right? That shoulder ink, as we call it, for want of a better term, will come out on the plate raised in the same way that typographic characters do. And when we print from this, what we'll find is that there's a, an impression behind that shoulder ink, which is not present uh, on hand press uh, produced objects. Is that clear? Good, good. You are a good crowd. Thank you. So, does this actually work? Well, we went, uh, all this was done digitally. I didn't uh, get to handle any of these books. The Library of Congress has some very uh, high resolution images of its uh, copy. And what I'm talking about here are those little lines there, the little line above the printed text. And what I've done is looked at, uh, this is a foliated book, so folio three uh, recto, um, there's that line there. If we reverse, if we look at three verso and flip it over, you may be able to see a little bit, say the number three shows through here. So we're looking at the back of the page and I flip the image. So you can see just a kind of shadow of the text there, very vaguely, uh, and the number three. Um, but you don't see a reproduction of this line. So, so this line is on three verso, right? There's no ridge of that, uh, that line pushing through because it's just shouldering. There's no force behind it. Whereas you do th see, um, uh, say, typographical characters pushing through on, on the recto. When we look at the Martian land copy, of the shoulder ink. First of all, I noticed that there was very, very little shoulder ink, only a couple of instances, but those instances were very, very dark. And one of the arguments that had been made in favor of the authenticity of SNML was that it was a deeply impressed letterpress book that was really pushed hard into the page, these characters. Uh, so again here, here we're on folio four, one of the few folios with, um, with shoulder ink. What I've done here is looked at the back of that page and flipped it over, and you'll see the text is completely legible because the impression is so deep. The number four there is legible. But what you also see is that the same, uh, the shoulder ink is impressed with the same force as the typographic characters. And that can't happen with uh, typographic printing and a hand press. Right, that has to be a photomechanical artifact. Uh, this is no mystery, this mode of uh, reproducing uh, books using um, photomechanical means. Uh, the wonderful Club Dumas, uh, a, a really silly but brilliant thriller, uh, published in the early 90s, describes in full how you would make facsimile pages using photo, uh, 
photopolymer plates. And they cost 10 bucks each. They're really cheap, and every good printer can, uh, can do them. Uh, don't watch the film version of that, The Ninth Gate. It's, uh, it's atrocious. Um, <laughs> I decided to forge the forgery. Uh, so with a printer from New York, Russell uh, Moret, we uh, decided to see just how difficult it was to produce a convincing 16th century impression. He had a 16th century book that needed repairing uh, in loose sheets, so he scanned it on a $300 scanner uh, and sent off the image to uh, somebody to make the plates. It cost about 10 bucks to make the plates, 10 for the, uh, the sheet. Um, and then you wash off the stuff in, this, uh, in that gook, and out comes a lovely, uh, lovely plate. You trim it, uh, and then, uh, because Russell knows what he's doing, you space out uh, the two pages correctly. It turns out that the forgers of the Galileo books hadn't thought that the relationship between the two pages should be a constant, right? That doesn't move. The margins between the two pages is not a variable in a normal print run unless you're uh, radically revising text. Uh, and they made their margins about a centimeter too small. Uh, Russell anticipated that problem, spaced everything out, uh, lays it down on the press, and uh, we used some very nice um, handmade paper, and the very first impression that we had produced a beautiful letter, letterpress impression. Um, the problem with this was that it was too good. Russell had to find ways to make it look less uniform, less standardized, uh, vary a bit the pressure uh, across the printed uh, page. So it's against both De Caro and Bredekamp's argument that this was a really, really elaborate hoax that required immense expertise and capital investment, I would say I could produce a convincing Galileo forgery for you a week from now for about $5,000. And you probably, even uh, people who know their rare books, would probably have a hard time, as long as I got hold of a good paper maker and made convincingly watermarked paper, you probably would have a really hard time spotting it. It's not expensive. Um, two concluding thoughts. In some ways, Galileo deserved, was asking for this all along. Uh, here's the uh, SNML. And here is a book published in 1609 by the same printer. Uh, this book has a forged imprimatur, uh, and it's um, basically soft porn. Uh, this is the kind of company that uh, the Sidereus Nuncius was produced alongside. It contains a series of uh, hidden lies. Uh, we've always said it's printed by Tommaso Baglioni. Not true. It's printed by an excommunicated printer called Roberto Mietti. And it moves through exactly the same channels as cl cl clandestine sorry, uh, literature, uh, being exported to the major book fairs of Frankfurt and uh, advertised alongside this kind of scurrilous uh, literature. And Mietti is most famous for producing interdict pamphlets blasting the papacy. Um, so in some ways, forgery was always present in the Sidereus Nuncius. That's not a very charitable reading, but I thought I'd throw that in. The other conclusion, this was discovered last week, so um, this might be the future of forging. This is an image from a 2013, so post De Caro, uh, auction catalogue from Minerva Auctions in Rome. Um, a previously unknown Athanasius Kircher uh, title, and there's another one in the catalog as well. Um, there were things I didn't like about this. The, uh, when printers put their thumbprints over stuff, I'm always suspicious. Uh, but tracing, uh, looking at other Kircher titles and looking at internal evidence in the, uh, the text of this, uh, with a, a group of Kircheristi, uh, we discovered that this was basically a mock-up taken by sampling letters from a 1640 Kircher imprint, messing around with them, probably using Photoshop, and producing this, uh, this quite convincing-looking, uh, previously unknown uh, imprint. 
I wrote to Minerva Auction House. You're the first people to, to hear this, but this made me really angry, and I want to broadcast it. Um, I wrote to Minerva Auction House and said, uh, you described that lot as unsold. I'd ver be very interested in looking at it. It actually talks, this text, about the Voynich manuscript, if any of you are into that, which Kirker apparently had for a while. And this is apparently the text where he says what he thinks of the Voynich manuscript, maybe. Um, and the head of rare books at uh, Minerva Auctions wrote back and said, oh, that, yeah, that doesn't exist. That's just, we just made that up for a joke. So this is the, perhaps the future of forgery is virtual forgery. You don't even have to make a uh, material artifact anymore. We can, the digital uh, has taken on a life of its own and now we can have documents which will enter the scholarship, I'm sure, merely by their uh, virtual avatars, which means um, the depressing take home lesson, we're kind of screwed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Nick, for that great, uh, fantastic talk. I think we have just uh, maybe 10 minutes or so to entertain any questions that the audience might have. There, are, there is someone with a microphone who will bring it around. I see a hand over here. Is there someone with a microphone? I think in the back. OK, great. Sure. So everybody can hear you. Wonderful. notion that you would see more open face type in polymer because the ink would slip more into the counters and so you could see actually uh, easier um, impression. You could see that it's polymer versus lead type. Right. Have you heard of that? I have heard people who claim that they can l detect differences in the angles of the impression of the letters uh, and that the spread of the ink is different on metal or, or plastic. Um, Printers tell me that that's the case and that they can spot the difference. But when I asked Needham about that, who really knows his books, I mean, I don't want to create the impression that, um, no pun intended, that, uh, that I, I mean, he, he's been, um, even though he reached the wrong conclusion, he did it very meticulously, if that kind of makes, makes sense. Um, and he said that he detected precisely the right patterns of spread on capital letters that made him think that metal had been used there. So that might be one way of de detecting that. On the other hand, I'm sure that you could probably take the plates. You can take the plates and maybe sand the edges of, uh, or rough up the, the surface or probably treat them in some way. And you could even get around my shoulder ink test. There's no reason why you can't uh, edit that out and hand apply it with a paintbrush, just stipple it in. And that, there you go, there's your 10,000 buck forgery. Uh, that's, that's, not an, that's only a, a good way of detecting this particular wave of forgery. This is kind of like Lance Armstrong and the, and the drug cops. It's going to be constantly shifting. Um, but what we need to do is think through precisely that kind of question of how do you spot the difference? Thank you. Other questions? I answered everything. I have a question. Thank you, Nick, for a spectacular and thought-provoking talk. Um, one of the things that strikes me as odd here on Horace Breitenkamp's part, and I say this acknowledging that I have not read any of the four Magnum opi um, that have emerged from this enterprise on this part, is that why would Galileo make his first um, visual representation of an astronomical observation on a already written book emerging from yeah. those conclusions. It makes no sense. It, makes no sense. it, it makes just no makes sense. But it's terribly exciting if it were true, right? But it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, no, and the paper is unsized and he's using watercolor and it bleeds it no through. There's, yeah. like, there's so much that in retrospect makes no sense. But group psychology is a <laughs> weird thing, right? right? And nobody's ask that kind of question. So he, you know, so he wants to believe something that if he were dealing with paintings, he would not right. believe. So I think one of the challenges here is when you have people that are experts in one set of technologies and uh, representational technologies, um, they are transferring those skills to another technological platform 
um, their uh, normal common sense essentially fails them. And I think that's one of the issues. In order to do the work you're doing, um, one has to be an expert in five, six different sort of separate discourses. And the challenge is, of course, nobody can be that expert. Um, right, or you just have to... Uh, so that wasn't a question, that was a blurb. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, in the back. Oh, excuse me. How do you think Minerva did that digital fact system? Didn't that kind of ruin their reputation? Uh, I think so, yes. That's what I'm trying to do now. <laughs> <laughs> they said it was a joke. They said they got but bored just sometimes. they're saying that to, get to cover their selves. I, I really, I was so shocked. And this has had, I mean, I've been in correspondence with a group of people who want to track this down because they're into the Voynich manuscript and they think this could be the smoking gun. And, and I just got told, it was a joke, duh. Like, but I don't think that that's the right kind of, that's not funny in the current climate. Unless I just lost my sense of humor, I don't know. One question. Yes. Uh, on the fakes, were they using uh, paper from the right period? Like, can they test the paper, or, what, or is that too destructive to do to a book? Very good question. Uh, they, so the paper, it was noted, had watermarks, but they were very slightly different to the ordinary uh, run of uh, paper used in Sideris Nuncius. That's when another reason why Needham said this is a proof copy. It was taken from a different set of stock, but it's Venetian. Um, it turns out, one of the things they didn't do was look at it through a microscope. When we showed that it was a forgery, they looked at it again, and they said, even if, okay, so typographically it's a forgery, but as far as the paper's concerned, we didn't screw up. Then they looked at it through a microscope, and they saw cotton fibers in there, which means it's 19th century at earliest. Um, and it's a mystery to me why they didn't just look through a microscope to start with. That would have solved everything, right? That question simply wasn't answered. They did chemical analysis of the ink. They did all kinds of 3D confocal microscopy stuff uh, without asking the basic question, is this genuine or not? Now, you can do invasive testing. You can do carbon-14 testing. And some people have said that that's, gonna, that's the definitive test. But you, there is a lot of paper stock from the 17th century around. Whether you could match up uh, watermarks for an entire book, I'm not sure. But you could pulp up 17th century paper and it would pass a carbon-14, and remake paper and it would pass a carbon-14 test. As long as you know a good paper maker who's willing to make a monogram, and there's nothing illegal in that, right? making paper, nothing necessarily fraudulent in that. Uh, the papermaker probably, probably doesn't know what end it's being put to. Um, I don't think the paper presents that large an obstacle. Although there is, again, the connoisseur's touch. Some dealers handled this book, opened it, didn't even look down, just said, that's not, that's not Sideris Nuncius paper. And they didn't know what it was, but they just said no. Um, so uh, I think we can appeal to, there are, you know, this isn't a story about expertise failing as such. It's about some expertise failing and some conversations between experts failing to happen in the correct, uh, correct order. But if they, if they took, the pap took existing paper from that time period and remade it to get blank sheets, it would be indetectable as far as detecting age. Yes, as far as I understand this, yes. Okay. You might maybe have problems with the sizing, but you get paper resized. I mean, I don't understand. One of the ways around this would just be to present a heavily washed, uh, ironed, rebound several times copy, which is the normal state of rare books, right? Why try to make it look like it's hot off the press in a way? Like, try, try and make it look newly, oldly new. Uh, so there are ways around that as well. We'll take question? One, one more question from the gentleman over here in the striped shirt. Well, um, I can't help but notice that there's a certain analogy with the housing bubble and some financial bubbles in that the incentives are all for, for all the participants to rather participate in it. There's hardly any benefit to be gained from pricking the bubble, if you will, or for finding uh, um, the forgery. Um, there's even, I think, a German movie called Stonk, 
which appeared, I think, maybe 20 years ago. And the sto it's a totally fictional story, but it's a story of two people who figure out, imagine that they're finding Hitler's paintings. And th then they go to sell it. And the st movie essentially shows how everybody suddenly sort of makes the calculation like, I'm going to be better off going along with this scam than trying to expose it. And uh, so th I was wondering whether that's why, even if the expertise is available, it isn't always brought you know, to target that fast. Yeah, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, Needham and Bredekamp and the, the entire team didn't make any money from this. So there's no sense in which they were direct beneficiaries. Uh, but as we all know, the credit of academia and the commercial world have very strange relationships. And it's good to make a discovery and you want to believe it to be true. Um, but, and it's sometimes, you know, sometimes I think, well, what's the harm of making more first edition Galileos? Wouldn't it be great if Georgia State doesn't have one? We'd love one. That would be great. This is democratizing history. On the other hand, as a historian, I have to say, like, a census of extant copies matters. This is historical documentation, and you mess with that, and I'm out of a job. So I think there's a, you know, a moral responsibility for us to dig in here. Uh, and resist temptations to sign off on stuff uh, and pop as many bubbles as possible. I mean, it makes housing cheaper in the end. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>